What's up, everyone? My name is Edson Cardona, and I want to welcome you guys to the Hashtag Let's Kick the Series. On these episodes, we get the pleasure to be joined by professional athletes, get a little insight on their background and how they made it this far in their athletic careers. A conversation between athletes about their journeys, leading them to success. I hope you guys enjoy. What's up, everyone? Hope y'all keep it safe with the COVID-19 pandemic, and my hope is that we're all doing our part in standing in solidarity with the racial justice movement and against police brutality because Black Lives Matter. My name is Edson Cardona, and I want to welcome you guys to another episode of the Hashtag Let's Kick Series. On this episode, I have the honor to introduce Eric Hurtado. The better chances, make no mistake about that, but Dunlady and Darvin Quintero losing possession easily and quickly splitting Kansas City going the other way. This is the kind of center forward that Eric Hurtado is. He wants to run in behind the two center backs. He wants to get all timer from Eric Hurtado. At, this is such a difficult skill. Andy O'Brien for Jairo Arrieta. And that's what their job is in there. Well played by Eric Hurtado here. Can he get a shot away? Hurtado! The wait is finally over. Eric Hurtado scores his... For Morales. Lovely first time ball for Hurtado. Furthest man forwards. Taking on Alonso. Might have a go here. He's beaten two men. Tight angle. Doesn't matter. Two goals in two games for Eric Hurtado was born in Fredericksburg, Virginia, moved to Portland with his mom when he was five, ended up moving to Mexico with his family when he was 11 and played soccer for Pumas and Atlas while going to the sixth grade, then moved back to Portland after a year and continued playing club team where he won six state cups and two regional championships, played high school soccer and won two league titles while getting back-to-back -back Oregon State Player of the Year in 2007, 2008. Played at Santa Clara University for four seasons, making an all-conference team, three seasons in WCC Player of the Year, his senior year, as well as NCAA All-American team for 2012. Drafted number five overall to the Vancouver Whitecaps, playing currently with the Sporting Kansas City and the fastest player in the MLS. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Eric. What's up, brother? How you doing, man? What up, dog? How you doing? Good to see you. Thank you for having me. No problem, man. I want to thank you for taking your time. You know, busy schedule. I know you guys got games and stuff. I know everything was, you know, put in halt with all this stuff going on in the world. But I appreciate your time, man. Yeah, of course. Unfortunately, that was the case. But, you know, I'm here right now. So let's get at it. Yes, sir. So, you know, everyone has a has their story as an athlete. And I mean, to start off with, how did your journey as an athlete begin? Uh, I'd probably say when I was about five or six years old it was just me and my mom out in Portland and I just had so much energy um she couldn't contain me by herself so she put me in sports and soccer was the best way to get the energy out of me because it was non-stop running back and forth you know um but that didn't even stop me I would go come home with even more energy because I love playing soccer um and so uh yeah man probably started when I was about five or six and I was the fastest guy out there on the field and I just continued through it they put me in the club, and you now the rest is history. Yeah, definitely. I mean, being, you know, uh, an athlete at such a young age, you get to really see, like, your passion and what you really wanted to do. So was soccer the only sport you played growing up, or were there other sports that you played as well? Uh, soccer was the only organized sport that I played growing up. Um, I wanted to play basketball, football, baseball, but my dad thought it was best that I just stuck to one sport so I could – perfect that craft because that would give me the better chance at making it further and it worked out um but I love playing all sports uh, with my friends growing up like after school um you know during recess and stuff um I really love basketball and football too I mean that's awesome right you really get to see what sport you know you're most passionate for and like you said soccer was the one where you try to perfect your craft and as we can see now you made it to the big league so all that work you know paid off and so when you're younger and like I spoke a little bit about you had to move, you know, many places and you moved to Mexico. I mean, how was that transition for you as a, such a, at a young age to move, you know, all the way to a different country? It was hard at first. I'm not going to lie. You know, um, I had maybe like a two week notice from my family. 
uh, my family lost the house that we had. They couldn't make the payments anymore. Um, and so we didn't have anywhere to go. So I thought it was a fresh start for us to go down and live with my dad's, my stepdad's parents down in Mexico. Um, and so we went down there and within, within like, I think three weeks to four weeks, they put me in a, in a school. Um, and so we're in Mexico. So everyone's speaking Spanish and I don't know any a lick of Spanish and, um, you know, kids, at that age, they don't like outsiders coming into their area, you know, and I don't know Spanish, so they don't want to talk to me. And really the only thing, the only way I connected with anybody was soccer, you know, because I could play soccer with them, you know. And so playing soccer with the kids at school, playing soccer with the kids on my team, and even the best times that I had were playing soccer out on the streets. You'd get these big old cement blocks and put them on the road. And then when the, cop, when the cars would come through the streets, you'd pick them up and move them. And when the cars left, you'd put them back and you just play with each other. We'd be up till till it was dark and that was that was that helped me get through it um and out there on the streets is where I learned most of my Spanish with them and within the next like month I was able to like speak pretty fluently um with the kids and, and then it became a lot easier I mean at such a young age you know you really get to you grow up fast you know and like you did you're able to really see you know at hard times you're able to grow and that's kind of the biggest thing that I can see in you where such a big part of your life was moving to Mexico, you know, at a young age and really realizing like, you know, it's hard for me, but you know, you got to keep on going. That's what you did. So once you moved back to Portland, I mean, how was it again to transition back into the States and, you know, keep that motivation for yourself, you know, keep on going, you know, on the sport that you love and, win all those championships that you did, you know, throughout uh, your um, club sport and high school? Uh, so, you know, coming back was almost just as hard because I was in, I was ingrained in the culture in Mexico and I was speaking Spanish every day. I didn't even speak uh, English to my mom, you know, so I was, I was a little Mexicano boy down there, you know, and I, and then I'm coming back to the States where it's completely different. You know, and I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay down there. It's crazy because I didn't want to go to Mexico in the first place. And now we're leaving almost a year later and I don't want to, I don't want to leave. And so <laughs> it was hard to leave all the friends that I made there again um, and come back. Because when we came back to Portland, we didn't come back to the same area. We didn't come back to the same neighborhood. Um, we were honestly, we were living above my uncle's restaurant in this uh, little attic space that has, that was like maybe, maybe, 600 square feet for my whole family, um, two bedrooms, and then like one like living air, uh, living room. Um, and so we were there for a couple months and it, it was hard, bro, because I, I didn't get to see any of my old friends that often because my parents were working nonstop. I would just go to school and come back and it was, an, it was a new school. Um, but one thing that I stayed with was my club team. Um, so as soon as I came back, I was able to start up with my club team again. And so I was able to see them at least a couple times a week. So that really helped me get through. I think that's why I have such a, a strong passion and such a strong love for, for my club West side and for my players on my team. And to this day, those are, those guys are the, my best friends, you know, in my life. And, uh, and so, yeah, man, just uh, seeing them a couple times a week really helped me until I was able to get back to my old neighborhood and my old, uh, my old school. And yeah, you really got to, to see, right. The difference on, like you said, I didn't want to go to Mexico in the first place. And now I don't want to leave, you know, after being there for so long. And so you really, you really get to see that part, you know, when you live a life, when you have to move, you know, come back. And like you said, that transition wasn't easy once again, but you still fought through and soccer was there for you, you know, that passion on playing the sport every day, you know, in and out, that was kind of what, what kept you alive. And so yeah. how was it for you after being, having this motivation to keep on going, the passion that you had? I mean, tell me a little bit about the experience that you had to getting, you know, scholarships and getting all these different offers from schools. So, you know, in the beginning when I was, you know, U11, U12, U13, it was, it was pretty easy for me because I wasn't, I wasn't a smaller guy. I was probably about the same size as everyone else. And and I was pretty fast, so I was I was able to like do do what I wanted. But um, around the age of 14, um, 15, 16, even like 13 and a half, kids were just growing, and I was just staying the same. And so it got harder and harder. So I just I just I realized that guys were getting bigger, and I wasn't. I was still fast, but I had to I had to work on my skills, and I had to work on other things to get out of tight spaces where they were going to come and crack me. 
And so I just dedicated myself to, to working on my skills and my ball work. And, you know, I, I think that's when I really fell in love uh, with the game. Um, there was a couple summers back to back that I would go to the, to the rec soccer field. It was this big um, recreational um, athletic center that had about five soccer fields, a few basketball courts, a few baseball fields. And me and my friends would go there like every day um, during the summertime. I'd probably be there from like nine in the morning to like seven at night, like no lie, dog, all day long and just playing, playing all these soccer games. And, and I, I just really, it just, it loved me. Um, and I loved it back, you know, and I didn't really get, I didn't really have that good of a, a an in-home relationship, you know, with my family. And so that was a way for me to get away and to really just like be free. And so, um, that being said, when I was about 15 years old and I was in high school, you know, a lot of kids go through troubles, you know, um, and I didn't make, I didn't make my high school varsity team and I didn't even really play on my JV team. You know, I was the leading goal scorer on the team, but I played maybe half the games because I was so small and they didn't think that I was, I was going to make it. I wasn't going to be good enough, you know? And so then I just, I wanted to quit. Honestly, I, I, I told my mom, after my freshman season. So it was like the winter time. I was like, I want to quit soccer. I don't want to play anymore. She was like, she's like, you don't want to do that. And I was like, yeah, I do. I don't want to do it. Like, I'm so small. Like, I'm not going to make it. Like, no one thinks I'm good. And she's like, she talked to me. She told me what she needed to tell me. And, uh, and I was like, all right, well, I'll do this. I'll give this one last try and I'll give it everything I got. And I just put in the work, yo. I just put in the work. And the next year I made the varsity team. Uh, we had fitness, we had fitness tests and I, I killed everybody. And I just, I just got as fit as I could and um, as quick as I could with my feet. And I, I led the team in goals and assists as a sophomore, junior and, and a senior and uh, became, and we were the first team to beat like the Jesuit private school, like in our league. And we were the first Westview, my high school team to win a Metro league title. Um, and I got back to back state player of the year. Um, and at the same time during that, time with my club team we won a three-peat in the state championship you know and so <sighs> everything kind of worked out but I want to kind of credit it to the to the belief that my mom had in me and the belief that I reinstilled in myself and the never giving up because if I would have said nah I don't want to do this anymore and she just let me go then none of that would have happened you know and so just the perseverance um when anyone's having a hard time it's easy to give up and that's why not everybody makes it. That's why the majority quit because it's hard. And if it was easy, everyone would do it. Yeah, I mean, that discipline that you had, right, on being put down, you know, as a freshman, thinking, like, you weren't good enough, at the end of the day, that put fire in you, you know, and always believing in yourself. And I think that's the biggest key as athletes because that's kind of where, you know, the mental side comes in play, you know, it's, it goes hand in hand with, an athlete you know if they aren't mentally strong like you said like you were you could have easily quit and luckily you also had the support of your mom where she was telling you like hey you know you got this like it might be hard right now but you never know where this might take you and so all that hard work that you had I mean you got a full scholarship to Santa Clara University I mean how was it for you to transition now and all that hard work, you know, all that discipline that you had, showing your high school coach, like, hey, you should have put me in as a freshman, you know, but, and then winning that three piece. So how was it for you, you know, now coming to Santa Clara University and tell me a little bit about your experience there. Yo, that was, that was a dream come true, man. Cause my mom always made me promise to her that I would go to college. And um, I got my first offer when I was a, when I was a sophomore from Oregon State. It was a full ride, and so she was just crying. She's like, "You're going to college no matter what. Um, you have this as, as a backup." And but I didn't. I didn't want to go in state during that time. I wanted to go. I wanted to go to California. And so I think it was my soft during my sophomore year, junior year. Um, I was talking with Santa Clara quite a bit. They saw me at regionals, um, and and they were telling me how they were interested in me. And they at that time they were number three in the country. So they were better than UCLA, better than uh, Santa Barbara, better than Stanford, better than Cal, better than all those all those big dog teams. And so I was like, I bet, like, top three team wants me to come there. Like, they're going to offer me good money. Like, I'm down. Um, and so originally they weren't going to offer me a full, a full ride. They, uh, they didn't have enough money um, for me. But then I think after my junior year and they saw what I did, 
then money came available somehow. You know what I mean? They were able to move stuff around and, and, and get me the, and get me the money um, and make it work. And uh, and it was just it was amazing, man. Because you know, in Oregon, there's only a few athletes that really get that type of opportunity to go somewhere with like a full ride athletic scholarship. You know, and and at my school, I was I was one of one of maybe five, maybe four that were able to do that. So around the area, um, there, there was a lot of hype around it. And so it was cool to experience that and, and uh, you know, to really live up to what people wanted for me, you know. And, uh, you know, I was going to Cali. I couldn't have been more excited, man. I remember going to regionals um, uh, after my senior year of high school, and we won regionals, and it was the first time. And that was right before I was going to go to Santa Clara. And so it was the first time that an Oregon team had won regionals and we were going to nationals. And then two weeks after that, I was going to Santa Clara and I was like, yo, this is life right now. Like, I, like, I cannot be stopped. Like I cannot, I'm going to be happy no matter what. And so we went to it nationals. Can't be, and, it can't get better than this. huh? Yeah. It can't, it can't get better than this, man. This is, this is it. Like I'm playing soccer every single day um, with my homies every single day, um, you know? And, and so it was, it was, it was a bit good. Um, and then got to Santa Clara and, you know, it was amazing. It just got to go on campus. You got to get away from your family. You got to be on your own. You got to do your own thing, become your own person, you know. Um, and then, boom, fitness. Fitness like I've never experienced in my life. I know you know it, dog. Running lines, BBs, uh, BBs. Um, what, what was the one where you would go doggies. to the doggies? <laughs> oh, my gosh, doggies, man. Six back, 18 back, half back, other 18 back, other end line back, and under like two minutes. And then you got to do that like three times in a row. That was our first training session. And I was like, luckily me and like the, the rookies, the freshmen have been doing this, uh, this preseason program. Um, and so we were pretty fit, but it was still, it was still rough, dog. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, I definitely remember those times, man. I mean, going, I went to Santa Clara, too, so I definitely know what you're talking about. I mean, every, I know every collegiate athlete who plays soccer has done some type of fitness, you know, and it's not easy. And so, I mean, you, you've gone through so many obstacles in your life, you know, and you overcame all of them, you know, at such a young age, you know, overcoming, going to different places, coming back and being the player that you are now, you know, showing those who didn't believe in you, really, like, hey, like, I'm the player, and I'm the best player out here, and that's why I'm going to a four-year university. And so after playing, you know, four years at Santa Clara University, you got, you know, onto the NCAA All-American team. I mean, you won also WCC, you know, Player of the Year. And once you, you know, the draft was coming, I mean, what were you really experiencing? Because, I mean, it's every dream. Every, every athlete's dream to go into the draft. And so what were you really feeling and how sure did you know that you were going to be drafted? Um, so it was after, after season, I was invited to the combine. And at that point they had signed. Uh, so you signed with the MLS and they had signed, I think maybe five uh, generation Adidas players and, you know, generation Adidas, those are underclassmen, freshmen, sophomore, juniors, um and they signed them and then they helped them finish college and they get paid like the bigger bucks and then they have senior signings and those are guaranteed contracts and they probably had about four senior signings um that they did and that was that was usually it that was what they did and so what i was basically going for and everyone else in the combine was going for was going so teams could see you so they could bring you into camp and back then they had semi-guaranteed contracts which was if they liked you, then they would sign you for six months. And then at June, if they didn't like you, they would cut you and they would, you would leave. Um, so that was a big risk too for college, college athletes because you would be essentially dropping out of school to probably possibly getting dropped from the team and not having your college scholarship to help you finish out, you know? Um, and so, but I, I, had, I had a bunch of self-belief and I, I knew that I was gonna make it. And so I was going to that combine like, I'm going to go here and I'm going to get a contract and I'm, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to do my best and I'm just going to work my, my balls off. I'm going to do everything that I can. And I'm going to show everyone that doubted me because I didn't really get that much hype um, from, from East coast, from, you know, um, the big people, you know, MLS, MLS coaches, because on the West coast and the WCC, it's a small conference. You don't get that much exposure. 
And so I, re I really wanted to show them what they were missing and what, um, what they were underrating. And so I went there and I had been talking to an agent, um, the same agent as Danny Mwanga. And we've been in contact. And so he was like, yeah, just go out there and do your thing. Um, I hadn't signed with him yet or anything. Um, and so the first couple games go out, we do um, – we do the 30 yard dash, we do the vert and we do the, like the shuttle, the, like five yards, 10 yards, five yards. Um, and I got like top three and all three of those got, had the fastest 30, had the highest vert. Um, and so that was like a standout right there. Everyone was like, Oh, wow, this, who is this, who is this guy? And then the first couple of games, bro, honestly, I, like I balled out. Like I was just, I had so much energy. Like my pace was just, they, you couldn't deny the pace. I was just getting blown by everybody. And, um, and I, my dribbling, like I was taking people on, like I was making stuff happen. And after, after the third game, during the third game, the coach didn't start me. And he was like, you've done yourself a lot of good. We're going to keep you cool right now. Um, we don't want anything bad to happen. Like if the game is going well, we'll put you in the last half an hour. And so I was like, I didn't know what that meant. I was like, I was like, yo, just because I was like, no, I have to play. I have to play. Like I have to do everything I can. Like I, there's only one more game because I didn't. I didn't know how good that I was actually doing, you know, cause I was so like focused and I would like, I didn't, I didn't know. And so um, he put me in and, and I did well, set up another goal. Um, and, and then I get a call from the agent at the hotel, maybe like two hours later. And he goes, he goes, Hey, what's going on, buddy? And I was like, good. How you doing? He goes, um, I just wanted to say congratulations and welcome to the MLS. And I was like, what? He's like, they offered you a contract. And I was like, no way. Let's like, go. He was like, he's like, yeah, they offered you a, they offered you a senior contract. So um, I'll send you over the details and, and just wanted to say congratulations. And you did it, man. I'm really proud of you. It's like, this doesn't happen very often where players come in here and they offer you a contract at the combine. And so we were, that was in Florida. And my plane ticket was from Portland to Florida and Florida back to Portland. And so what they ended up doing because they signed me was that meant that the majority of the teams in the top 10 said that they would take me as a top pick. And so um, they flew me out from Florida to the draft along with the other signing. So it was just like us 11 players because back then not everybody went, you know, because they didn't all have contracts. So they flew me out there. Um, and I was like, I felt like royalty, bro. Cause I was with all these guys that had already signed, you know, and I, I felt out of place a little bit, you know, I was like, Oh, these guys have been signed. Like these are the big dogs. This is who everybody wants. But I was like, you're with them too right now. All right. Don't forget it. You're with them too right now. And so they put me up in a hotel and everything. And I just, it was like the first experience that I really had where I was like treated like uh, I guess a professional athlete, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, bro, food was comped. Um, Drinks were comps, um, non-alcoholic beverages, um, <laughs> um, and and I was able to fly. Or my mom and grandma were able to fly out for the draft, and my best friend was able to drive up um, and and be at the draft as well. Uh, and and yeah, bro. So we had during the combine, we had interviews with all the teams and talked to them. They would ask you questions like, "Oh, how'd you cope if you came into the?" into the club and you didn't play and you know the response was oh well, I'd work harder and I'd be there for the team you know and they're like y'all but what if you don't play and I'd be like well I'd find a way to find a way to play you know and so you just had a bunch of different teams talk to you about stuff and like your style of play and and so that went into like who wanted to pick you um and so I kind of they my agent asked me who I wanted to go to and I was mm -hmm. like I just want to I just want to play anywhere man I just want to play anywhere um and so draft day comes and I'm sitting in the little area where the, where the players are with the family. Um, and Vancouver comes up with pick number four. And then I think, I can't remember who had pick number five. I want to say Montreal had pick number five and Dallas had pick number six. And my agent had told me that Dallas was really interested in me. And I was like, Oh, I'm down to go to Dallas. It's in the States, you know? Um, Texas, it's not too far from the, from the West Coast. It's not completely East Coast. Uh, I, like, I'm cool to go there. And so, like, they pick Akuta Mane at number four, and then Dallas looks over at me, and they go like that. And I'm like, oh, shit, I'm going number six. And I turn, I'm like, hey, I'm going to Dallas, I'm going to Dallas. And then all of a sudden, Vancouver makes a trade at number five. And, <laughs> and I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm like, okay. And then the Vancouver coach looks over at me, and he goes, like that 
And then I was like, oh, I think I'm going to Vancouver. I think I'm going to Vancouver. And then <laughs> they say with the fifth pick of the draft, Vancouver Whitecaps select Eric Hurtado. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's crazy. Because I thought I was going to Dallas. And I was, like, thinking all these things for, like, four minutes. And then all of a sudden I was going to Vancouver. I was hyped for the opportunity, hyped to go to, like, a new place, a new country. And it was only, like, six hours away from Portland, you know. So that wasn't bad either. Um, and then it was just, like, super surreal, like, Everyone showing me love, like sending me support, you know, just like taking pictures with the owner and the president and Kakuda. Um, me and Kakuda become like lifelong friends, man. Like we're we're still cool to this day. Um, and and yeah, bro, it was a crazy experience. I mean, like I said before, it's a dream come true, you know. And like you talked about it, you know, all that passion that you had, you can definitely see all that hard work paid off. You know, you actually felt for the first time like your worth you know and being able to see like multiple coaches wanted you now I mean like you said at the combine you're like oh hell no I want to keep playing I want to keep showcasing my skills you know so I can get the best chance to make it to the MLS and once you did get that call I mean it's amazing right your story just it's it's gone from literally you know you started from the bottom and you really see your growth as a player once you got to you know going back to Portland then winning championships there, you know, going to Santa Clara, getting all those type of awards there and now getting, you know, to your dream, you know, your dream that you wanted for so long. And yep. so now after, you know, signing your first contract and everything, you know, being happy about going to Vancouver, you know, like you said, being hyped. I mean, there's also a lot of obstacles that athletes go through when they make it to the pro level. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. easy to get there you know, and like you spoke about, they ask you, like, what if you don't play? So if you can tell me a little bit about that and that transition for you to now making it to the pro level, but now you're a rookie again, you know, just like when you started at Santa Clara. So if you can talk a little bit about your transition on now making it to the pro and what obstacles did you face and how did you overcome those? Yeah, um, so the beginning of the season, preseason, was was awesome um I came in and you know I was part of the starting lineup like right away in preseason um and then I had a little hammy problem that put me out a couple weeks and so that put me out of the lineup and that turned me into a sub and that was pretty hard um because I wanted I wanted to be a starter but I knew that I was a rookie I know I, ha I had a lot to learn and so I kind of was just like you know what it's all right like just you know play this role if this is a role that you have right now but you got a whole season you got a whole season to get that spot back. Um, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to get that spot back um, during the season. We had um, Camilo Sandeso. I don't know if you remember who he was. He broke out that year with – he led the league with, I think, like 23 goals, got MLS player of the year. Um, we had a great uh, a great vet, Kenny Miller, um, and he was, he was a baller too, um, high-profile player, designated player. And then we had uh, – Darren Maddox as well, who would, I think he led the MLS as rookies and goals a year prior, you know? And so I was coming to a team of firepower like that and I wasn't able to get many minutes um, after that. And it was hard, man, because I was, you know, I was, I was a man, but I was still, I was still a kid, you know, I still wasn't grown. I still wasn't mature. Uh, it, I wasn't as mature as I, as I, as I needed to be, you know, um, up in Canada, I felt alone up there because my family was down in Portland. They didn't really get that many opportunities to come up. I had some friends come up every now and then, but still, you know, like you're, you're going to your job every day and, and those are the people that you see every day. And besides that, you're not really out making that many friends, you know, cause you're recovering from practice. You're, you you want to be staying out of trouble. You don't want to be do, getting yourself into bad things or into bad habits. And so um, it, it was hard not playing and it was hard being away from, um, I guess I'd say uh, like you at the U.S., you know, because um, Kenya is very different. It's a beautiful country, beautiful city in Vancouver. But, you know, I just got a little homesick that first year. Um, and so it, it was hard. Um, but I, I knew I knew where I was. I knew I was still a rookie and that I had I had a long career ahead of me. And that and I, so I stayed after I would do dribbling exercises with the coaches. I do finishing exercises with the coaches um, and I just try to stay mentally strong and just try to keep um showing that I wanted to be there and stuff you know because I did um and then the next season uh we ended up trading Kenny Miller and Camilo went down to Mexico 
So then it was just me and Darren and I think Kuda and a couple other players that were playing up top. And Darren pulled his hamstring, and so I got to go in. And at this point, I probably wasn't going to be a starter. Darren was going to be a starter. I was going to come off the bench. And this is when I was playing wing back in the day. I wish I still played wing. I love that position, dog. Like, that's, that's my shit. Um, <laughs> um, but so that's when I was playing wing. But they put me up front because – they knew I could play up there. And so that game, I almost scored like two goals. They saved a couple goals off the line. Like I did well. And then the next game, bro, I score against Columbus crew and I scored five goals in a row, five straight goals in five games. Um, and everyone in Vancouver was like, what? And the coaches are like, what? And I was like, y'all been sleeping on me. <laughs> yeah, who's this? Remember who I am? <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and so, that was that was that was a cool experience, you know, because not only was I scoring goals, we were winning games, you know, and it was, and that year prior, we didn't really have the same experience. We we didn't have that, you know, that winning record. And throughout the season, like we were doing well, like I was playing a lot of games, and our teams were getting wins, we were getting points on the road, um, and that and that was kind of, I guess, you would say, my breakout season, you know, and uh, I got like seven goals, and then I got like four or five assists. Um, and that, that was in my second year. So I was super excited at the end of the year. I was like, oh, okay, like, this is back on track. This is this is where I'm at, you know. Um, and then the next year comes, and we sign a high-profile striker. And it's back to the bench for me, you know. And halfway through the season, um, I'm not happy with it. And I, you know, I felt how I felt. And so they sent me on loan to Norway, a uh, team in Myondal. You know, that was a crazy experience, too, because I uh, I went there to play soccer. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anyone out there. You know, the life of a footballer is lonely. People don't know that. Um, and I went out there. I was by myself. I didn't know the language. All I really did was, like, go there, play soccer, come back, and, and chill, you know, because the city that I lived in was 12,000 population, and it was about a 20-minute train ride from the next city, you know. It was just a small farm town. Um, I think there was like two two grocery stores in the whole town, um, and that yeah it was it was really small. So that was difficult being away. Um, and then you know just the rest of the time I was in Vancouver trying to fight for minutes. You know it it was hard, but it really it really helped me mature and helped me grow um, as not only, not as a soccer player but as a man too. Because it it made me because like I said like we talked about before like soccer was my way of of escape. It, it loved me. You know, it was, it was my passion. It, it helped me get through things. And now soccer wasn't loving me and it wasn't helping me get through this. And now I had to figure out a different way to be happy and a different way to cope with things and a different way to be a man and to grow up. And I think maybe that was the best thing for me growing up and for my soul um, to be enlightened and for my soul to grow and be happy because now if I don't play, it's okay. You know, like, like I'm sad that I don't play. I'm 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 frustrated that I don't play, but it's not. I'm not gonna let that dictate my happiness the next day. You know what I mean? Like I, I I'm here for the team. I'm gonna play the role that my team needs me to play, and I've accepted that, and, and that's good. And I just uh, I I can find happiness somewhere besides soccer now. And I think Vancouver really helped me help me do that. Yeah, I mean you you brought up a lot of great points. I mean one being you know, the life of a footballer is lonely. And, you know, a lot of people don't know that. I mean, you go away from your family for how many, you know, days of the year and you're out there, you don't get to see them. And like you said, you know, it's you go to training, come back home, rest, you know, go eat and repeat for the next day. So it's like you have to be able, like you said, to be mentally strong because, that mental side, you know, on being strong, regardless if you're playing or not, or even like you said, when you got injured and you were starting and, you know, that pushed you back, like you took 10 steps back, but once you got, you know, healthy, it's like you said, that breakout season was your second season and you showed that. And then once you did get loaned, I mean, at the end of the day, like you said, it might've been something that you didn't want, but it's something that you needed and you really saw and you can see that now, how much you matured. And a lot of people think, you know, being a pro is easy. You know, you go be a pro, you play here and there, you know, get paid, blah, blah, blah. But it's not. I mean, the, a, lot of, a lot of players don't get to play. And it's like, how do you 
you know, decide your, like you said, your happiness, because at the end of the day, you're doing what you love. But sometimes that outlet, you know, that you once loved and loved you back, like you said, is hard. And it's, and it's really difficult as a player. And it takes a toll, you know, like you said. Yeah, definitely, man. People, people only see the top, like the 10% of the iceberg that they can see. They don't see everything that goes down underneath the water. Yeah, yeah they, they definitely see what they want to see and don't, they don't know what's behind the scenes, you know. They don't see those days when you're, like you said, when you're abroad. You know, now you're thousands of miles away in Norway, different time zone. I mean, you can only call your family, FaceTime your family and friends. And it's like, how do I deal with this? And how do I decide, you know, yes, this is what I love and I'm going to stick to it. Um, and so after seeing all your success now, I mean, you're currently playing for the sport in Kansas City. And so winning all these types of awards throughout your life, you know, being the fastest player in the MLS, you know, getting drafted number five, you know, all these things that you work for, who can you really credit your success to? Shoot, man, who can I credit it? I don't know, man. I've, I've, I got so many people in my life that have, that have helped me throughout different stages of my life, you know, um, True, man. You know, I got my, I got my mom. I got, I got my brother, um, my sister. I got, um, I got my coaches in high school. I got my club coaches. You know, um, I got all my friends that always have my back. You know, and always pushing me when I was down and not getting playing time. They'd always hit me up, say, "Hey, keep your head up." When I was playing, I had a bad game. You'll keep your head up. You're, you're still a baller. You're still good, man. It's just one game. You know. Um, I'm I'm really blessed with having a lot of people in my life that have supported me and I can't just credit my success to one person. You know, I have to credit myself a little bit too for not giving up and for persevering through everything. Um, you know, and for growing the way that I have, you know. Um, but yeah, I'm just very fortunate to have a bunch of people that, that show me support and, and that help me get get to where I am today. Too many people. <laughs> No, definitely. I mean, having that support system like you talk about is, is very important. And especially in your career, when you, you were having doubts yourself on, you know, continuing playing at a younger age, you know, you had your mom. And like you said, even when you weren't playing now, you had those who were behind you and rallying behind you and being like, hey, bro, keep up your head, like, keep your head up, you know, not yeah. just, just like one game, you know, keep it up. And once the things come, you know, the ball starts rolling. And like you said, you scored five goals straight. And everyone was like, who's this? And you, like you said, you guys were sleeping on me, but I'm here, you know. I'm showing, I'm showing my face and I'm doing my work. Yes, Your sir. favorite soccer moment, if you can tell us. I mean, you have many goals that you scored. I remember seeing them all. Bangers, bangers and bangers. But which one can you say like was your favorite soccer moment? Where it's like in the back of your head that you can, you can tell us. Favorite soccer moment would be when we won regionals in uh, in Lancaster down in Cali, because um, that was that was my squad that I'd been with since eleven, ten years old, and I had like like four of my best friends were on that team, and like we would just kick it all the time and. And we were there, and it, we were in the final, and we were up 1-0, and, and then we were up 2-0. And then one of my best friends, he was, he was playing, and he's a, he's a dutz, bro. Like, he was on the goalie line. He doesn't play goalie. He plays winger. And the guy shot the ball, and he just put his hand up and blocked it. And there was, like, 15 minutes left. And so he got a red card, was sent off, and they scored the PK. And we're down a man playing in this heat, bro. Oh, my gosh. It was, like, noon, and they were just shooting just – attacking us, attacking us, attacking us. And we were like, come on, just hold on a little longer, hold on a little longer. And there was so much on the line, man. And it was, it was senior year. It was senior year. I just ended. It was a summertime. And, you know, this is what our club team and my friends and I had been working for like our whole lives. Like we wanted to be the first team to win a national championship. You know, that's like, as a kid, like you don't really like, you're like, Oh, I want to be a professional soccer player. Like I want to be the best. Like, but like when you're in the moment, like, you're like, I want to win a national championship with my, with my club team. These are my brothers that I'm going to die for. So that was like the most important thing in my life at the moment was to, was to win that. And we were just waiting um, for the whistle to blow. And finally the whistle blew. And I just turned around and everyone's just like running around, cheering, cheering. 
my friend who uh, who had the handball just comes running from behind the fence with his shirt off, screaming, yelling, throwing up water. We like do the old classic. We pour the Gatorade on our coach and stuff, and um, and that was that was probably the best moment, soccer moment of my life, um, because it was it was just I'll never forget it. And that feeling, um, that feeling was amazing, for sure. Those are definitely the moments, you know, you see yeah. and you you remember and you you say like I can't wait you know, to do that again, win another championship, wherever you are now. Yeah. And so to finalize, you know, our interview, what advice would you give to your younger self about the journey you've taken? Mm, I'd probably tell him to be patient. Um, be patient. Um, work hard. Create good habits. You know, um, not everything needs to be done right now. You know, life is a journey and uh, and just be patient with it and enjoy it. You know, find find the joy in, in the little things, you know, because you're not always going to be in the best situation. So when you're in a good situation, you got to take advantage of it, you know. Yeah, you definitely have to see, right, that passion that you have for the sport and love it, regardless, you know, what's going on. And I mean, you spoke a lot about it and the outlet was soccer, you know, and that's amazing to have because throughout all these obstacles and all these bumps in the road that you had, I mean, soccer was that one thing that you kept going for and that support with yep. your family. Your family was also, you know, a blessing. Um, oh, yeah. I want to thank you, man, so much for being part of the hashtag Let's Kick It series. I can't wait for what's next. I know a lot of things are happening in the world right now with the pandemic and with, you know, the racial justice movements and all that. So, I really thank you, man. It's a blessing to have you on the show, and I can't wait to see you, you know, play again and score a couple goals. Got to have your jersey back here, man. So got to get that one of those signed. So that would oh, be amazing. Oh, God. It's, uh, I, got it. I got some for you right here, bro. You need this? Hey, can't wait, man. Yeah, yeah, just shoot me your address, and I'll send it out to you. Can't wait, brother. Uh, I really appreciate you, man. It's, it's amazing to see. I remember as a young kid, I, we actually went to Nationals too, uh, I don't know, 2000 and what, but I was with my team and I remember seeing you play like the first day and you're, you scored a banger and I was like, damn, who is that guy? And then once I got, you know, to a camp at Santa Clara University, I saw you and it was like a dream come true, right? You're kind of someone who I've, I, I've admired, you know, and it's, it's great, you know, the relationship, the relationship we have so far and I'm so happy to have you on the show, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, dog. Always homies. We'll keep in touch for sure. Um, and yeah, bro, have a, have a good night and stay blessed. Likewise, man. Thank you, everyone who joined us today on this week's episode of the Hashtag Let's Kick It series. Once again, I want to thank Eric for being part of this episode. And I hope nothing but the best. And I know he's going to score a lot of goals soon once all this ends in the world. But for all those who joined, thank you again. And we'll see you next week.